Well, I mean, it's, it started out, I mean, it's a great concept uh, as far as I'm concerned having, first off, the community of bass players is a really special community. And beyond just the campers that are coming here, the, the idea of seeing all the bass players who have influenced me, who are uh, people that, that to me are all making a profound uh, mark on the community of bass. It's, it's deep to look around the room. I'm like a kid in a candy store when I, when I see all this going down. Uh, and then the people that are attending the camp, it's really great to see the diversity of players from people that are really accomplished musicians to guys that are just getting started. And I love the fact, I'm hoping this year I'll see more women bass players here. Um, it was great last year, there was more than the year before, or the two years ago, there was more than the year before. But I think it's a beautiful concept. I really credit HP for having a vision for putting this whole thing together. Um, I was unfortunate uh, that I wasn't able to attend last year when I had fully expected to be here. And then a, a complication arose uh, in my scheduling where I couldn't be here. And so I missed the uh, debut of this building that we're in. And uh, it's very cool. Just another one of these amazing concepts that, that Hans puts together. And, and they all seem to work just like his instruments. Um, so I'm thrilled to be back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really special, and, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm not so much, like, I'm not one of these guys that's just going to sit here and blow your mind with chops or anything. That's not what I do. I'm going to try to talk to them about really the demands that I experience on a daily basis, and I feel blessed enough that I've been a working bass player now for, you know, going on 50 years of doing this, and, um, and that I'm still busy. So I want to talk to them a little bit about the thing that's helped me stay in, in this pocket. And it's not all about flash and all that. It's really, song, really respecting songs, digging into the depth of a song and how to come up with parts. Um, so it's going to be fun. But really one of the nicest parts of this is when we get out of the classroom and then we're sitting around eating dinner and, and sitting with guys and, and really fielding questions. And also for me, when I'm sitting in the room with the other guys, when I'm sitting there with, with Steve Bailey and, and Bobby Vega and Chuck Rainey, I mean, it doesn't get better than that. So I, I'm picking everybody's brains and, and just enjoying the companionship because bass is a funny instrument. I've done many, many albums where there's been double drums, three guitar players, a couple of keyboard players, and me. So I see them like between breaks, all geeking with each other, and you're sitting there by yourself pretty much, or you're like the, the uh, kind of the poor relation. Um, so when you come here and you've got all the bass players together, it's really kind of nice just to share some experiences and stories. And once people start telling stories, it's, to me, that's, that's what should be recorded here. I was just sitting with Bobby Vega talking and, and, and Bailey, and uh, it's just fun hearing all these different stories from guys, because everybody's had unique experiences. <laughs> Well, I mean, certainly my career basically got launched with James Taylor. Um, I was in, always in bands up to that point. I met James around late 1969. And when, he, when I started playing with him, it changed the way I played because he's an amazingly comprehensive guitarist and his thumb is always playing bass lines. So I had to figure out really a way to justify being there. 
am I just going to copy what this guy's playing or am I going to figure ways of weaving around him, you know, respecting certain benchmarks within a song, but then also having the flexibility to move around that. And in, in doing that, we ended up creating a style with myself and Russ Kunkel and Danny Korchmar initially that sort of hearkened an entire movement in music um, with the, that kind of West Coast California sound. And that's when like Jackson Brown and Linda Ronstadt and the Eagles and the Burrito Brothers, all these things stemmed out of that. And it was a real pivotal time because I, I stepped into something I had never experienced before and had no really understanding because I was always in like hard rock bands. And uh, so to suddenly be playing the sensitive music um, was a little uh, disconcerting, um, but it, it ended up changing the landscape. And, uh, and, and it's funny, the thing I find fascinating is it's like it's run full circle now. And I'm working with a lot of like young artists that are in their 20s that all they talk about is those records and that's who they, they want to be like. And so they're coming in with all these beautiful songs and, and the way they play. And suddenly it's, it's almost like I've gone into a time capsule and I'm right back in 1970 again with a lot of these. And if there's no reflective surfaces in the place, then I'm cool because I don't have to see that, you know, 45 years has, has, has gone by. But it's, it's really interesting that, that, that this part of it has really gone on. And I've built my entire career a, as a songsmith, um, um, not one of these chops monsters. I, I just really, if, if I just am going to sit there and, and the song says, just go... I'm happy. That does not bother me. I don't look at that as a chop. You know, I mean, if that's what the song wants, that's what you give it. And that's really still the essence of what I do. And some of the stuff I do is incredibly complicated, but if that's what the song demands, then I can muster it up. But to me, there's no embarrassment in the whole note. So that's, that's the world I live in, still living and proud to be here and part of this. You know, one of the things I want to talk about in, in my classes here, and I think this works for the beginning, intermediate, and advanced, is when I go on, uh, on my Facebook page and I start perusing, like, the base sites on Facebook or I go on YouTube, and I start pulling up performances that people have posted, 95% of the time nobody's playing a song. They're showing off their chops. And I want to talk to them about, do you want to work or do you want to just, you know, maybe get in, into a booth at NAMM once a year and blow people's minds with your facility? Because to me, this is all, my concept of what this instrument is, it's a fundamental base for songs. And so I'm going to really just talk to them about addressing songs and find how you find parts that fit songs and support the rest of the music. You, you don't impose yourself with your chops on a song. You figure out what it is within your facility that's going to do the best thing for the song and i've been really lucky that that's worked for me for as long as it has when i show up on a session generally i might bring three possibly four bases with me i, I have my old frankenstein bass which is a whole long discussion about that which i've been using since 1973 um, a few years ago at bass player live um, Kind of, Warwick is like Godzilla. No matter where it goes, it leaves a giant footprint. And at the uh, Bass Player Live in LA, they had a really nice booth there. And that they do every year. <clears throat> and I walked in and there was a, star, a fretless star bass sitting there. And I picked it up and I really wasn't thrilled with my, my fretless. And uh, so I played it and uh, I went, this is really cool. And that turned me onto them. And when I got this one, um, I've used this Probably I've had it about going on three years now, and I've probably used it on at least 40 albums in the past three years. Um, and it's my road bass now. I've been touring with a girl named Judith Owen, and this is the only thing I take on the road is this. But on the sessions I would bring, I have a, a five string that, I've, that I have with Dingwall. Um, but this is the main bass I pull out at my sessions. If I need to go like an old kind of Fender flat wound sound, put a couple of pieces of foam rubber in the bridge and turn the tone down a bit and it suddenly sounds like an old P bass. Um, I have a, a special switch I had installed on my bass so that if I'm doing a session and I'm, I'm playing like this and they want something really much brighter, I just flip it over and I and they're thrilled, but there's actually no wires or anything that go to this. It's a fake 
switch, but you just change your positions, and uh, it's a placebo. I call it my producer's switch. Um, gets me through a lot of bullshit. Um, but, um, but I really don't bring a lot. I mean, I've been really, really, I think, blessed that whatever my style is has fit so many genres. I mean, what I played with James Taylor and what I played with Billy Cobham was not dramatically different. The parts may have been different, but tonally, I'm really still in the same pocket. With Judith, it's the same tone that I use. I've been doing so many different genres. Um, we're doing um, Steven Tyler's Christmas record right now. Same bass, mm -hmm. same tone. Um, it's just, it's almost like a universal tone that seems to fit within all these contexts. And every engineer I work with just always goes, man, I love the sound of that bass. I love, the, it just, it gives everything a place to sit on. There's, it's not, you don't hear fret buzz. I use mandolin frets on every bass. And so there's really, you know, when you, when you do a, you can really allude almost to fretless at times, you know. You can play around with it and you hear a little of the definition here, but the nuances of that within a track really kind of tone down. And I've had people, I just finished doing a project over the last weekend um, where I had to do 10 tracks for somebody in one day. And they wrote back and they said, I love the fretless stuff that you did on it. It wasn't fretless, it was this. It's just the way I approach it. And I put a little bit of pitch shift on it. So, um, but I really go pretty minimally. I don't, I only bring two pedals with me when I'm in the studio. I bring a Boss OC2, because I still love octave divider stuff. And I have an ancient TC Chorus flanger. And that's it. And I don't plug them in unless I need them. Um, I use a, an old... Um, well, who the hell was it that made that? I have a DI, um, tube works that don't exist anymore. I think Gens Benz brought them and uh, bought the company and then destroyed the product. Um, but I've been dragging this thing around forever and it's a great little DI that doesn't color the tone. Um, where a lot of the things like the Evil Twins and, and Avalons have so much headroom and so many other parameters in them that to me it's almost a preamp, it's not a DI. And I like the simplicity of just giving them as pure and clean a signal as I can. And if they want to add things later, sometimes during the course of a song, I'll give the producer engineer suggestions of things that could be added later. And if they want, they can run it back out to, into the studio and, and regenerate the bass out there and put a mic up and do some stuff. But I try to give them as basic and, and clean a part as I possibly can and then let them build from that. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> I think that um, my, my, if I have a beef with anything, it's the music business. It's not, the, not music. Um, I, I'm hearing and, and seeing so many great artists at this point, still as good as any I've ever worked with in my life. Um, the biggest problem that I have is so many times, as, growing up, I mean, I, I can get into the analog, digital, discussions and all that, but that's almost a moot point right now. My, my concern always is don't become an old fart and just talk about the good old days because there were great things that went on that aren't happening anymore, but they are starting to happen. I'm doing a lot of records nowadays with full band in the studio cutting live, so it's not all just sitting in guys' bedrooms overdubbing on Pro Tools. Um, but the real problem that seems to happen is in the old days, there was, as much as everybody hated them, there was a label. They had a machine in place that could get artwork done, that had promotion, that could get you on the radio. Now we finish all these projects, and then I get guys calling me going, uh, any ideas? What can we do now? Because they really, there's nothing in place unless you come up with a quirky thing you put on YouTube and hopefully get some hits, or if you know somebody that might get a song placed in a TV show or something, which is really... For guys, no, that's the ultimate. Man, get something in a movie or TV which will get you some stuff because I, I, these guys call me and they go like, I had you know, 400,000 hits on YouTube, or, or, or especially back in MySpace days. And I'd go, if that was a buck, a hit, you'd be rocking. But what does that ultimately mean except for your ego? Um, unless there's some guy sitting in a room who's hired to monitor hits on things and then goes and hunts those guys down. And maybe it's like the next Green Day or something like that, or no doubt that they find that way. Uh, it, but it's, it, it's very strange. There's so much talent out there, but the vehicle for being able to make a living at this is difficult. And I get these people that, I mean, I'll, I'll probably say this in, in my clinic too, um, but you get to the point where people say, I want to do what you did. I, I, I want to do that. 
And I go, it's easy, man. You just go home, get your dad's tools in the garage, and you build a time machine and set it for 40 years ago. Um, well, you can't do that? Well, then you're kind of screwed. But I temper that with when there's like a huge lottery and they tell you, you could be hit by lightning 10 times before you're going to win that lottery. Yet the next day on TV, there's some knucklehead standing there with his big check and he's just won like $200 million. Somebody's prevailing in this business. There will be people. It's just the odds are, are really kind of not in your favor to have a successful... If, I mean, I've been lucky that since 1969, I've not had to have another job except play bass. Uh, I know very few musicians nowadays that don't have other jobs that, that, that can sustain themselves with playing. And I was never a writer, so I'm not getting mailbox money. My, my income has been strictly as a player. And uh, uh, so it's, it's a difficult time, but it's, it's really the business that's really suffered. God knows there's talent out there, and I really don't care what medium people are working in. Uh, I wish more guys would uh, enjoy the, the idea of cutting without click tracks because there's a thing that happens then, an organic thing that, that y there, you can't express in words. But everybody's scared to death of it because they have to cut so much so they can intercut and, and do stuff. Um, but more and more, I've been doing a bunch of projects and we've gotten new artists to walk away from click tracks and say, let's just do performance. Let's just get, if the, if the chorus rushes, so be it. It's, if everybody's rushing together, then that's what it needs to do. So, I mean, there's, a, there's this element, like I said, of, of, of it's going full circle, and there's a lot of things that harken back to the beginning of my career, and, and it's really refreshing uh, to see it, and also to see it through young eyes when you're in there with somebody who's 22 years old experiencing it for the first time. And it makes you not feel like you've been jaded, but you've been away from that feeling for so long. You kind of jump on their coattails and go for their ride with them. And it's pretty cool.